Zoe for sharing your wonderful gift of music um, with that piano piece during our prelude today. Well done. We appreciate it. With that said, um, I'd like to encourage you. Do you have any spiritual musical gifts that you would like to share with the congregation? We would really appreciate whether it be uh, an instrumental piece, um, it could be a trumpet, a flute, a piano, play the organ, or a solo that you would like to share, or maybe there's a couple that would like to get together and do a duet. You can do that. Um, you can video it or audio it and send it to us here at the church. Or if you need to come here to the church um, and record, we can provide a safe way of doing that and keep our social distancing practicing going. But it is a wonderful way to bless the people from our congregation and around the world who are tuning in. Um, yes, actually, I was able to check some analytics on our website, and we have people from many different states watching, and actually sometimes we even get a, a clip or two from another country. Not sure if that's spam or not, um, but we do believe that the Word of God travels in unique ways and exciting ways. So if you're able to share um, your spiritual gift of music with us, we would appreciate that. Let me know. Well, today is April 26th, 2020, and we join together once again via the online world of technology. You know, it continues to be a difficult challenge, but we must be grateful that we do have this opportunity. That even though many are stuck in their homes, uh, many are still quarantined in, in places where they're not able to go out, that we can still connect together and connect with God through worship from our church faith communities. So let us be grateful to God for that. And as we continue to look forward to the day where we are able to join back together. I wanted to take a moment and thank all of you for your texts, your messages, your cards, phone calls, words of appreciation. Um, your encouragement to me as we continue to try to put together uh, Bible studies each week and do these Sunday services this way. It really does help, um, especially when I feel like um, I'm not by nature a video person. Uh, I'm not a video editor, so these challenges have been unique, but I appreciate the encouragement. And with that said, I would encourage you, if you have any ideas or suggestions, or if you want a different angle, or if this is too loud or too far away, whatever it may be, send us your suggestions. We want to make this um, uh, suitable to your watching needs. With that said, in addition to being able to download this via YouTube and our church website, um, a, an individual from our congregation has returned to the ability of putting our services onto DVD. So if you have a loved one, especially perhaps elderly people who don't have internet or may not like to tune in online, who would prefer a DVD of our service, please reach out to the church and let us know. It, it may not be available till late on Sunday, um, but we will do our best to get that to them um, in a timely manner. So again, if you would rather have somebody watch via DVD, let us know and we will do our best. This Tuesday evening, our church council will be gathering together for their monthly meeting. And I would like to encourage you and ask you, our congregation, to be in prayer for them. As we discuss the future of our ministry here at St. Peter, um, our short-term plans and our long-term vision uh, for how we are going to reach our community of faith during the COVID times and in the, the years ahead. We know our world is different now and it will only continue to change, but we want to, 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 to adapt to these needs and perhaps even lead and be a leader um, uh, for people to find ways of encouraging people to worship uh, via technology and things like that. So please be in prayer uh, for your church council. Lastly, in way of announcements, I would like to once again remind you of our church website, www.stpetersgp.org. That's www.stpetersgp.org. Um, and remind you that we have recently refreshed the look of the website. There are many different um, things on that website that should benefit you, including a calendar, uh, items of future events, if we ever have any. Um, there are links to download our weekly bulletins, our monthly newsletters, opportunities for you to download our most recent and even past sermons and Bible studies. 
and an opportunity to go on and give to your church ministry here at St. Peter's and to support electronically uh, through online giving. There's a link to the history of the church. Uh, we'll be putting more things up, links to devotionals, links to our association website. And again, if you have any suggestions, anything you can think of to help make this website useful for you, please let us know, as it's important that we're able to communicate at all times. Thank you for, for those who have put time and energy into the transition and update of our website. And now, would you join me in responses in today's call to worship? It's a uniquely written liturgical call to worship by Catherine Hawker, and I would encourage us, wherever we are, to call ourselves to the presence of God and invoke the Holy Spirit to be in our midst. Let us begin. The voice calling long ago, the voice calling today, the voice compelling Jonah to go, the voice compelling us to go, the voice calling Jonah to Jonah, compelling him to share the good news of God's redemptive love. The voice calling to us, compelling us to share the good news of God's redemptive love. With those who would be enemies, the people of Nineveh, beloved of God. People we don't like or love, people and beloved of God. The voice calling long ago, the voice calling today. Let us pray. Merciful and awesome God, we thank you for this opportunity wherever we are, in living rooms, our dens, our bedrooms, at work, however we are tuning in to this service. We pray that your spirit would join us together. Hear our prayers this hour. Hear the love behind our singing. Be with us as we read your word and open our eyes and our minds that we may understand it. And be with the teaching today as we look at Jonah 3, that it would remind us that you are a God of second chances and of our responsibility to share the good news with the world around us. We thank you, God, for giving us this opportunity to, to worship today. And we now ask that you would hear our song as we lift up our voices to you. Amen. Would you join me in singing our opening hymn today is Pass It On. Let us sing together.
Thank you, and, and I truly do hope that you um, are able to join in singing at home. I know it may feel odd singing by yourself or with your family, but music provides a wonderful opportunity for us to glorify God and, and to lift up our spirits. Um, I invite you now to join with me in thought and in prayer as we continue to lift up those in our church, our family, our community, and your loved ones um, who are going through difficult times. I have a pretty lengthy list as it continues to grow um, of individuals that we are to be praying for. I ask that you would continue to pray, be in prayer for Nancy Lukey. Uh, Nancy is back home from the hospital after a fall and is convalescing there. Prayers continue for Carla Leonard as she regains her health and strength. Prayers for young Ethan Toth. Um, He's probably about six weeks old now, uh, doing well after a recent uh, surgery. Prayers continue for 14-year-old Mason Besick. Um, Mason is paralyzed from the neck down and in need of our prayers and support. Prayers for Dolores and James Catton. We continue to pray for Nancy Sturm. Nancy, we pray that all is going well for you as you continue to to regain full movement and strengthen your arm. Prayers for Shirley Cope, Bev's sister, Bev Junker's older sister, as she is home and going through rehab from a recent stroke. Continued prayers for Carter Fortin. Uh, received a, a positive um, update on Carter this week, uh, but he was going for some more tests and will be getting, I believe it's his fourth round of chemo. We continue to pray for Carter. Continued prayers for Mary Serps after a recent surgery. We continue to lift up Austin Delaney. Prayers for Melissa Mort in her battle with cancer. Continued prayers for Steve Redistance as he continues to rehab from a recent surgery as well. We pray for Tom Barrera. Um, Tom had his second knee replaced this past week and he will be an Iron Man soon once again. Uh, but we pray that his rehab is going well. As for prayers for the family of Susan Hammond, um, Susan is Gary Eckhoff's sister, and she passed away this past week unexpectedly. So prayers for her entire family. We pray for the family of, of Elaine German. I think that's how you pronounce it. Elaine is Frank Hoss's wife. Uh, Frank was an interim pastor here. Uh, she died tragically this week in an automobile accident. Um, she was traveling with Frank, and Frank is currently hospitalized. We spread the word um, earlier this week on social media. Um, there's an opportunity for you to send cards to the family, but pray for Frank in his recovery. Also for the entire family is not only they're separated from their father and loved one due to hospital regulations, but also they are mourning the loss of a wife and mother. Lastly, I ask that you continue to be in prayer for all of our shut-ins, for Mildred, Mabel, Louise, Minnie, and Pauline. Would you quiet your hearts wherever you are and, and silently join me uh, in some words of prayer. Almighty and most gracious God and Father, who is clothed in majesty, you have displayed your mercy and great love for us by offering us the free gift of salvation. As your exquisite beauty is displayed throughout the creation which surrounds us, the flowers blooming, the grass turning green, trees budding, the sound of the birds chirping, and the sight of them building nests as they welcome their offspring, we are reminded of new life in us, your children, a new life clothed in eternal glory and in the presence of your Son, Jesus Christ. You know us, O Holy God, in such a unique and intimate way, and you know that we are a human people who struggle with sin, though we desire to please you. Forgive us, we pray, when our life's actions don't match the faith that we proclaim with our lips. Forgive us when our lack of faith and our doubt overshadow our proclamations that we make before one another and others. 
We thank you that your heart is full of love and that you offer us that forgiveness. We also give thanks that you watch over us in our weaknesses and you offer healing, physical, spiritual, and emotional. As we pause today to remember the loved ones in our lives, our family members and in our church and in our communities, we pray that your hands that created the beauty around us would once again prove their power by providing healing to those who need it most. We especially pray for Nancy Lukey, Nancy Sturm, Austin Delaney, Carla Leonard, Shirley Pope, Melissa Mort, Ethan Tall, Carter Fortin, Steve Radstitz, Mason Besick, Mary Serbs, Tom Barrera, Dolores Catton, James Catton, Elaine German, the family of Susan Hammond, and the family of Frank Haas. Also, we remember Mabel and Mildred, Minnie, Louise, and Pauline. We ask that your hands of healing would be upon their lives and that they would feel your presence and experience your love in unique and exciting ways. We also pray for our leaders who strive minute by minute hour by hour to provide wisdom to our world that is full of confusion. Help them to lead by example, to strive to bring unity and love to all peoples. Guide and protect our doctors, nurses, medical staff, and hospital workers as they treat and work with people who are ill. Give them strength and energy, love and hope, to continue their work as faithful workers to the vulnerable who are around them. May the same hands of protection be upon all essential workers, first responders, store clerks, and anyone who must be in close encounter with other people. Protect them from viruses and illness. Oh God, also comfort those who are hospitalized, those who dwell in nursing homes, care facilities, in other places as they struggle day by day with not being able to see or be in contact with their loved ones. Give them understanding and give them a sense of hope that they will soon be able to have visitors once again. God of peace, as we lift our hearts and minds in prayer this day, remind us of the promise of eternity, where one day we will walk with you, worship you in your presence, and join the choirs of angels and the saints who have gone on before, where sin and sickness no longer dwell, where death no longer reigns. Thank you for your risen Son, Jesus Christ. May we share stories about him to those around us. May we remind others of the gospel news that salvation comes to all who call on the name of the Lord. And may we always be reminded of Jesus' own teachings and his words, when he taught his disciples to pray, we pray in one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God's word, God's story of mankind is full of promises. I encourage you, this is a new song to me. Um, some of you probably have heard it, but I encourage you to sing along as we sing the hymn, Hymn of Promise.
I encourage you to open them to the book of Jonah. Um, or if you want to follow along, if you printed out a copy of this week's bulletin from the website, um, or the words will also be here on the screen. Um, but the reason I encourage you to grab your own Bible or a notebook is so that you can jot down notes during the message, underlying verses and words that stick out to you. If God speaks to you in unique ways, uh, whether it be through the message or something else that you think of, write it down. Remind yourself of these um, encounters with God and when you reread your Bibles, you know, as you read the scriptures over and over. But I invite you to Jonah chapter 3, the story of Jonah going to Nineveh. It reads, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message that I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, they put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, he took off his royal robes, and he covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation that he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they had did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and he did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. Well, as you might imagine, being a preacher, I find myself tuning into a lot of sermons from various ministers, especially lately, having some of this opportunity to learn and grow from one another, my colleagues, um, as most of us have been forced um, to doing our services online. I like to tune in to what my past churches and uh, friends are preaching and how they are running their online services. I like to tune in to other churches around the country as people are sharing their links to their services and getting an idea and getting inspired by what some preachers um, have to say during these times. There doesn't really seem to be much else to do at times um, as we're sitting around in our homes quarantined, but it's not also a bad thing to be doing. But as I was thinking about this, I've probably heard hundreds and hundreds of sermons in my lifetime. Some from people all around the world. I've heard sermons from preachers of a variety of denominations. Some were from male preachers, others were female preachers. Some were from pastors of small country rural churches. Some were big city preachers that have thousands of people within their flock. Some sermons were from black preachers, Hispanic preachers, and white preachers. Some were from those old and what we would revere as wise and experienced preachers. And then I've heard some from pastors who are just getting started in their ministries. In the same way, I have delivered quite a few sermons in my lifetime. I wish I had kept track of all of these sermons by topic and by, by verse and by location of where I preached them and by date. But the truth of the matter is that that would have required me to have a good filing and saving system. And filing and saving things is not one of my spiritual gifts, I will confess. But if I had to take a guess, I'd say that between my Sunday morning sermons, funeral messages, wedding messages, special holy day messages along the way, that during the year 2019, I probably delivered around 60 different sermons. Here in 2020, this would be about my 20th message, if I include Ash Wednesday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and so forth. 
And if, while pastoring over the years prior to coming here to Grant Park, if it's possible, and I'm calculating these things on a more conservative range, it's possible that I had about 150 to 200 sermons that I preached prior to coming here at past churches. So if I add all those up, I would calculate, again on the conservative side of things, that I have probably delivered 250 to 300 sermons in my life. Now the number really isn't that important, but if I add up the sermons I preached, plus all of the sermons that I've ever heard, I can only assume that I've heard some really good sermons, and I probably have also heard some really bad ones. Likewise, I'm sure that I've preached some really good sermons, and possibly, maybe, just possible, bear with me for a second, maybe I preached a couple that weren't so good along the way. Some sermons that I've listened to have probably put me to sleep, or at least made me feel like taking a nap. Others probably made me walk away and think, what in the world was that preacher trying to preach about? It made no sense to me. Some messages probably left me at least considering the message that was delivered and thinking, does this message apply to me, and if so, how? And then there were probably some sermons that made me sit up, take notice, and put a fire in my belly, and had me respond by wanting to go out and be obedient to God's calling. Most of you have probably been in similar situations, haven't you? You've heard bad sermons, boring sermons, entertaining sermons, inspiring sermons, encouraging sermons, challenging sermons. But let me ask you this question. Can you ever recall hearing a sermon that was so boring, so repetitive, so condemning, so monotone in, in nature, that you left fired up for God and challenged to put your faith into greater action? My guess is probably not. But today's message, in a way, is about a sermon. It's about a message that was delivered that was kind of like that. And it was Jonah's message. I want to take a few moments and walk through chapter 3 with you. We read these verses a few moments ago, but I would encourage you to take your Bible and to follow along. And like I said earlier during the scripture reading, to underline things that jump out at you. Or if God puts something on your heart, a thought or something, write it down in the margin of your Bible or in a notebook. So that later in life you can recall what God spoke to you as you look deeper into Jonah chapter 3. Let's look at it a little bit more into detail. Well, verse 1 says that the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. You may ask yourself, well, when was the first time? Well, if you go back to chapter 1 and begin by looking at verse 1, the phrase begins, this, the passage begins, it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Well, that was the first time. And what was this word? What was this instruction from God to Jonah? It simply was kind of put in two parts. First of all, God told Jonah that he needed to go to Nineveh. Nineveh was this great city. It was a city that um, I don't even know how to compare it to. We'll talk about that in a few moments, but it was a sinful city. It was a city that was looking to answers from a bunch of other gods and walks of life. But we're not relying on the living God, the true God. And Jonah was told to go and to preach against Nineveh because it had come up before God. Its wickedness had come before God's presence. And God was at a time where he must have had enough. And he said, you know what? I am tired of the way people in Nineveh are living, so I'm going to have to punish them. And do you remember what Jonah's response was? Well, it says in chapter 1 that he ran. And not only did he run, but eventually he went and he hid in the lower parts of a boat that he was on. He was trying to flee from the presence of God. And as he ran and as he hid, he fell asleep in regards to his obedience to following Jesus. We discussed this several weeks ago in our first lesson um, from the book of Jonah about sleeping Christians. And we asked, how many of us hide or go to sleep within the church, and we hope that no one will see us or disturb us. 
Or we sleep in a place where we don't have to do any work or ministry, where it's comfortable for us and we don't have to have responsibilities. We hide in our pews on Sunday morning, but we don't come around because we don't want to have other responsibility within the church. Or we sleep and we're unaware of the problems that are around us. We're not present together within the body of Christ to know the people who are hurting, to know the situations that are around us, the needs of the people, not only within our church, but in the community. Those on our prayer list, those that we need to be encouraging, we're not present. We're not staying in tune with the real hurt, the real pain, and the ministry that is needed by all of us. We're asleep. Or maybe we sleep and we don't even realize that the danger that we're in. We don't realize that there's a storm brewing around us, that our boat is rocking. And just as scary, we sleep while the unsaved world around us needs to hear good news. And all the while, we are saying, but, but we talk about Jesus. We use the right words. We walk for Jesus. I mean, we at least, you know, we go to church and we like to wear our crosses around our neck, maybe our t-shirts with our catchy religious and Christian slogans, or we put memes on our Facebook status to make it look like we're walking like Christ. We have a passion for Jesus. We have joy and we rejoice in Jesus. We think about Jesus quite often during our days. Every once in a while, we'll go, oh, I wonder how Jesus would, would respond. But we forget that you can talk in your sleep, you can walk in your sleep, you can cry in your sleep, you can laugh in your sleep, and you can dream in your sleep. And still, during all those, those times, we are still not awake. And one of the conclusions that we came to was a thought from Charles Spurgeon. When he wrote, if a man is spiritually awake, it means he has thorough consciousness of the reality of spiritual things. When we speak of, of an awake person, it is one who does not take the soul to be a fancy, nor heaven to be fiction or hell to be a tale, but who acts among the sons of men as these were the only substances, and all other things the shadows. He's saying that Heaven and hell aren't just things to be talked about. They're not fallacies. They're not things that are just made up. They are of real, in, of big importance, vital importance. Those are the things that we need to be talking about and not the shadows of other things in life. When we go to the water cooler, so to speak, we should be talking about um, repentance and salvation and the things of God's world instead of the weather or who got drafted number one in the NFL this week. Spurgeon goes on to say, we want to be people of stern resolution. For no Christian is awake unless he steadfastly determines to serve his God, whether fair or foul. Yet Jonah's response to the word of God in chapter 1, when it came his way, was to stay away. To run away, to go to sleep. And the result was almost catastrophic for him. Why? Why? Well, we saw that during this time, a violent storm arose in his life and the lives of those who are around him, their lives were in jeopardy. And the only um, and final viable option for them, for the sailors, was to throw Jonah off the boat and into the raging seas to be thrown to what they presumed. And I'm sure what Jonah presumed would be to be thrown to his death. But we read and we continue to read through Jonah and we see that God spared Jonah. We see he provided a great fish to swallow him. And during that time, he kind of forced Jonah to get real with God, to spend time humbling himself, to spend time uh, praying and meditating on God's word, and probably to plan if God, if you are able to ever get me out of this situation in life, how will I respond? And we saw Jonah's response in through humility and through prayer was that he made a vow with God. He made a promise to God. He says, basically in verse 9 of chapter 2, that God, if, if I'm ever to get out of this belly of this fish and back thrown onto dry land and in your presence, I will go and preach a message of salvation and that salvation belongs to the Lord. It only comes from the Lord. And upon that promise, God's sovereign hand, so to speak, reached into the fish 
into the throat of that fish and it gave that fish to vomit Jonah out of dry land. And what a relief that had to have been for Jonah. You must have thought, I'm alive. I survived. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And quickly, quickly, as we transition from chapter 2 into verse 3, God quickly goes to work once again in Jonah's life. And it gives him the word, the assignment once again. That assignment was to go and to preach. This time, Jonah obeyed. Thank God for second chances, right? He could have always left Jonah to die. He could have always put a call on your life or my life to go do something or to be a part of this ministry or to go on a mission trip or to share the good news with somebody else. And we may have ran away and he may have just said, you know what, phooey, let Pastor Kyle die. Let you die. That's not God. He could have chose someone else. He could have said, you know what, Kyle, you screwed up. Kyle, you decided to run away, so I'm going to choose someone else uh, to fulfill what I wanted you to do. And you know what? They're going to receive the blessing. They're going to receive the joy of knowing that they led somebody into a relationship with God or help lead someone away from the error of his life or her life. But he didn't. God could have always found another way. He could have said, okay, you know what? You're not going to preach to Nineveh. I'm just going to destroy it. He could have said, you know what? You're not going to preach to Nineveh. I may send plagues until they repent. No, he gave Jonah a second chance. He didn't give up. God doesn't give up. If it is his will for us to do something, he will find a way. He will find a way to wake you and I up, to humble us, and to spur us on to doing what he had in store for us originally. So Jonah enters Nineveh. And like I said a few moments ago, Nineveh was a great city. It was a huge city. The Bible says that it was so big that it would take Jonah three days to walk through it. I can only imagine, I'm just trying to picture how big this city must be. And I can only kind of compare it in my mind to maybe New York City and all of its boroughs of like Bronx and um, I don't even know what the rest of them are. Can you imagine a great city? It took Jonah three days to walk through it. And for 40 days, as he was walking throughout the city, Jonah preached this message. He preached 40 more days and Nineveh would be overthrown. That was it. That was his message. Well, I'm sure that was an abbreviated message or, or an abbreviation of the message that he had shared for 40 days. And perhaps the message was extended a little bit longer by saying, you know, 40 more days and Nineveh would will be overthrown unless you repent and change of your ways. And if you don't, God will punish you. But I don't even know about that. Because when we get to verse 10, we will see that God has a change of his approach to how he's going to respond to Nineveh. So prior to verse 10, the only thing that we can presume is that God was going to, to deal with Nineveh's wickedness. And that Jonah's only response was, his only responsibility was to tell them, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Jonah didn't have a catchy sermon title. May have gotten their attention. He didn't have a catchy sermon illustration. He didn't have to entertain his audience with silly jokes, as I'm sure there aren't many silly jokes that can go with right before you say, 40 more days and you're going to be and perish or be overthrown. He didn't have a sermon of hope and encouragement. And as I thought about it, it was probably one of his worst sermons, one of the worst messages he ever put together. It was probably one of those sermons where the people walked the way and they were shaking their heads and they probably said, wow, that was boring. But at least, they were probably saying, at least it was short. Or, wow, that preacher is crazy. What is he thinking? Or, wow, his theology must be off. God doesn't punish the wicked. God's an all-loving God. Surely he wouldn't destroy us, the people he created. This guy must be preaching out of his rear end or something. But what was the people's response? 
What was the true response of the people of Nineveh? It says that they believed God. The first response that any unbeliever must have if they are going to draw close to God is that they must believe. The Bible says, for whoever believes and confesses and professes that the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. You must believe. They believed, and then they fasted. Fast is something, fasting is something that we don't really understand. We know what it means in medical senses. Um, in medical terms, when a doctor says that we must fast overnight before a procedure or blood work in the morning, and we think to ourselves, so I have to go from midnight until 8 a.m. without food? And we, hope, and we struggle with that amount of time. But fasting was a much longer period of time in the Bible. They would put on sackcloth. They would humble themselves. And it would basically be a time of lamenting and crying out and asking God for help and for salvation. God, save us. It was so meaningful. Jonah's message was so meaningful, even though it was short and condemning, that it drove them to believe and it drove them to fast, but it even drove their leader, the king, to make a proclamation. Well, it was one of the worst sermons I have ever heard, preached by a man named Jonah. But in the same time, he had one of the greatest results spiritually in the lives of thousands and thousands of people. That Remember how big that city was. There must have just been thousands of people there. And his message, that short message of condemnation and proclamation that they were going to be destroyed, affected their lives spiritually. They came into a relationship with God. They repented of their ways. And how could such a bad message, in my mind, how can such a condemning message, how can such a message like this be so effective? Because they were God's words. They weren't Jonah's words. He was only the instrument that God was using to speak to them. Friends, if you ever have a situation in life where you have to share the word of God, and I don't even mean have to share the word of God, like you're forced to, but you're privileged to share the word of God, don't fret. Don't be afraid. Because if your message is truly from God, and if you're sharing with someone because God's put it on your heart to share with them, there's a reason why. And God will use you, my friend. He will use you as his instrument to share what it is he wants you to share. All throughout scripture, we see men and women who are just ordinary people. They have flaws like me, they have flaws like you. They don't have the ability to speak. They're not eloquent looking. They're not people that most people would want to listen to, but God uses them because we're instruments. We are vessels. But first we have to wake up. We have to stop running away from God. We have to stop hiding in the bottom of the boat or in our churches or in our homes. We have to wake up. We have to humble ourselves and, and ask God for forgiveness and bow to him, promise to him that you will, the next time if you're given another opportunity, that you will step up to the plate. You have to be obedient, even if it's your second chance or third chance or 100th chance. And in Jonah's obedience and in the obedience and repentance of the Ninevites and the king, verse 10 shares the result. It says, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. Christian friend, the Bible is very clear that there are people in this world, people in your family, people in your school, people at your place of work, people in your neighborhoods, people all around you who are on a path of life. And that path only leads to one of two places eternally, heaven or hell. It is also clear that God has commissioned, he has told all believers, you and I, priests and, and people in pews, all believers to share the good news, to go and make disciples of all nations. To lead people into knowing Jesus. We have a role. 
We have a responsibility to share the good news. But the truth is that some of us have ignored or are ignoring our responsibilities. Some of us, some of you may have set out to be sharers of God's love. Maybe you dreamt of being a preacher or a missionary or just a godly man or woman who, who doesn't fear sharing the good news with their neighbor or people in a grocery line or in a, in a grocery store line or wherever it may be. But since you have fallen asleep, maybe because you didn't like your assignment. Well, I know preachers who don't continue their ministry because they don't like where they're at. I know people who don't like to share because they don't like having to tell their family members, their colleagues. You don't like having to go to your noisy, your messy, your annoying neighbors or classmates. You don't want to give them a second chance. You don't want to even give them a first chance at receiving the most precious gift, that gift of eternal life. So what have you done in response? You've run away and you've hidden and you pray that God doesn't find you and say, you know what? Wake up. But the eternal destiny of your brother or sister, your son or daughter, husband or wife, mother or father, aunt or uncle, your neighbor, your boyfriend or girlfriend, your teacher or student, your boss, colleague or employee, their eternal destiny lies within your response to God's calling. God's hard to understand his love. It's hard to understand God's love and his plan in this world. That if a person doesn't call on his name and doesn't humble themselves before him, that they're going to hell. I don't like that message. It's hard for me to grasp. It's hard for many to grasp that God, a God of love and compassion, would be like that. But that's his plan. It's his will. The Bible says it's his good, perfect, and pleasing will. And their destiny, my friends, is in our hands. It's in my hands. It's in your hands. Put your hands out before you for just a moment. And look at what God gave you. The eternal destiny of your loved ones and the strangers around you, the people God has put in your hands, relies on you. It relies on on me. We better wake up quickly and start sharing because their responses might just surprise us. Maybe our parents, maybe our children, maybe our brothers and sisters, maybe our cousins, maybe our neighbors, our teachers, our students, all the people around us, maybe they will encounter the living Christ for the very first time and surrender their lives to him. And maybe, as verse 10 says in chapter 3 of Jonah, maybe God will relent. Now, don't get confused by that word relent. It's not a, a change of God's plan. It's not like he regretted telling the Ninevites that they were going to be dealt with. It's not like he said, you know what? Maybe my plan isn't fair. Maybe that's not the way I really wanted to handle it. Let me go back and think. No, no. He's not saying today, you know what? I wish I wouldn't have sent my only son, Jesus, to the cross. There had to have been another way. He's not second-guessing himself. But this is an affirmation of who God is. Dr. Reverend Jeremiah, David Jeremiah teaches that. It's an affirmation. It's not a change of God's will. It's his willingness to allow us to change. But how are we going to respond our message of God's redeeming love, it may take us four days to preach. It may take us 40 days to preach. It may take us 40 years. It may require us to walk around for three days through a city or through a town or maybe three decades. No matter the amount of time it takes, we must be willing to share. We must be patient. We must remember that sometimes when we plant seeds, they don't grow right away. Maybe God is waiting for his perfect timing 
to have them grow. But it doesn't say that we have to wait for his timing to sow. Because his timing is now. We're to sow the seed. We're to distribute the seed. We're to plant the seed. And let God do the rest. It's a good story to share. It's good news to share. And quite frankly, we are people in this world that need good news now. And what a better time to reach the masses than now. When people are tuning in to Facebook and YouTube and um, wherever sites that they are going, their, their podcasts, their television shows, they're tuning in to watch sermons. Perhaps you can give a sermon online through FaceTime or whatever it may be. Or maybe your sermon is simply just to call and tell or to share within your family. People are looking for good sermons. But sometimes the good sermon doesn't have to rely on your words. You just have to be the vessel. It's a story that I love to tell. What about you? Do you love to tell the story of unseen things above? As we close together, as you sing this song, I love to tell the story. Look at the words on the screen. Read the words. Sing the words. If you don't love to tell this story, I challenge you to get back into the Word of God. Start by reading the Gospel of John. Read through different passages and fall in love with God. Fall in love with His story and share it so that those who have never heard, those who have never seen, that they may have a taste of what is so good. Let us sing together. Amen.
It is more than just hearing the call of God on your life to go and preach, to go and share the good news. Our faith is more than just hearing. It's supposed to be doing. So go with the power of Christ in you. Share the good news to the lost. Make disciples of all nations. Teach them to obey, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, who gives us his love and his peace. Amen and amen.